Okay. Just getting the live stream up and running. Looking good. So I'll be a few moments. I'm just getting the uh, the charts sorted out and sim brief and little nav map. So I haven't sorted little nav map out properly yet. So file, flight plan. Uh, where is it? Open it from sim brief. Download the flight plan. Create the flight plan. Don't save what I'd already done. There we go. There's the neat version. It's got the SID, it's got the star, it's got the intermediate waypoints. We're looking good. So we'll put little nap out of the way for the moment. So I've updated the um, the checklist I'll be working through. So this is me um, validating the checklist really. So let's just check the volume levels before we go any further. It's okay, but it's not the loudest it's ever been. I'm just going to move the microphone down a little bit. Hopefully it won't pick up my breath. Okay. Let's go and jump inside the airplane. Actually, before we do that, let's go and have a look at the airport just to show you. So we are at Gold Coast. I should have gone the wrong way here. I should point the other way out to the sea, shouldn't I? So you get to see the sun coming up. So this is where we are. Parked down in the corner of the, the airfield. And we'll be taking this runway. And going that way, I believe. They're on the wrong end of the runway. Anyway. Hopefully they'll be gone by the time we take off and leave. So, how do we get on with this aeroplane? So, battery one and two goes to on. Um, control eight. Nav light goes to high intensity. No smoking goes to auto. Cabin emergency switch is armed. Uh, your dampers, AP master and avionics can all go on in preparation for what comes later. Um, Anti-skid goes to on. And the yellow and green lift spoilers go to on. Okay, before we do anything further, I'm going to go into the tablet. This isn't on the list, but I think it might just be a bit of fun to do it. So we'll open the passenger door and put the stairs in place. And we'll fetch the flight plan from Simbrief. And then come back into aircraft. We can import the payload from Simbrief and it's flashing at the moment. So we have to go and click on the little button here and start the boarding. I guess we could do this a five minute boarding. That would do, won't it? So you hear stuff happening in the background just for a bit of fun. Um, it's really putting me off actually. <laughs> So passengers are walking onto the aeroplane, hopefully. Should we put some lights on as well on the instruments? So we can see what we're doing inside the cockpit. It's a bit dull because it's so early in the morning. Okay, so let's go and get on with the rest of the preparations. So overhead, go to the electric section, which is here. We put the bus tie Auto AC and DC to on. Oh, sorry, to auto, I should say. Um, standby inverters and standby generators to armed. APU generator to on. Um, put the left inner pump on. That will be the one used by the APU and on the APU we put the master switch to start 
and we wait for the needles to come up on the APU. So Justin Johns says hello in the live stream comments. Hi Justin. Okay, so we're just waiting for the APU to come up to speed. And now we can move on with the rest of the checklist. So, arm the emergency lights. And then go back then to the middle of the cockpit. Go and switch on the oil dampers. Um, and then go back to the cockpit and go and switch on the oxygen systems for the pilot and the co-pilot. It's really struggling with the scenery, isn't it, and the aeroplane. Anyway, um, overhead. Centre tank transfer has to go to auto. The ice protection goes to on and close it. Uh, com radios, so it's down on the centre pedestal. Go and put them on. It's all looking good. So in the tablet, we're going to go into the OFP app. Make sure that's in there and correct. It is. We've already done the boarding piece in the aircraft app, so we don't need to do that. So then we can go and calibrate the altimeters. So we'll press B. We'll calibrate the direction of gyros if we need to. Try pressing D. I don't think you need to in this aircraft, actually. Um, and we're going to program the UNS-1. So let's come over here to the flight computer and power it on. We're going to cheat slightly, we're going to try and get the, um, the flight from Simbrief. We'll see if it works. So just waiting for it to boot up. So we'll accept the AIRAC data. And then we'll go to the flight plan page and we'll take the focus off of this and copy the route. Okay, so that's not going to work. Let's see if this will do this live. So if I go flight plan and I go into here and I run the Simbrief downloader. And I want to get the current flight, which is there. And I want to put it into the Just Flight folder. So, export this file only. So it's put it into the right place. So this is the Simbrief downloader program. So then if I come back in here, and there it is, number two. So it's live. That's really handy. So that's put the basics of the route in. It hasn't done the SID or the star though. So we need to go into the menu button and say we are departing. And let's go and have a look at our flight plan just to make sure of what we're doing. So we are departing from Gold Coast. Let's go up there and have a look on the map. You can see us parked here on the ground. So we're departing runway 14 using the CG6 departure. So runway 14 is number one. And CG6 is number two. I press enter. We don't have a transition on that. That's all fine. So then it's just got vectors, which is good. And then we go menu again and we'll go to arrival and at the other end of the route, we're going runway 35 with the AVB 5A Menzi transition. Or well, AVBEG, sorry, transition, and then Menzi on the approach. So, what did we say? Runway 35 or 35, number 4. AVB 5A, let's just double check that. AVB 5A, that looks good, number 1. ILS Z35 is number 3. Press enter and the Menzi transition and that's it. So 
let's just have a flick through this and make sure it all makes sense. Yep, it looks good. Okay, so we've got the route in. Uh, what do we do next? <laughs> so, um, configure nav radios as required. So back in the cockpit. Actually, let's get rid of this clipboard out of the way. We don't need it because we've got our own checklist. Uh, we're going to go and turn on the nav radios. And turn nav 2 on. Uh, what's next? MCP. So yes, this is the MCP. The runway we're taking off from, we said, was runway 14. So we'll go and change the heading bug. Actually, we're going to be using GPS as well, so we'll switch the system over to RNAV. So you can see we're already pointing almost the right direction. So we can move the heading bug, look. And just leave it on the same direction. That's pretty much correct. Runway 14. Okay, so then what else do we need to look at? Um, initial climb altitude. So let's go and have a look. Have we got any restrictions on the way out? Let's have a look on the chart just to make sure. Uh, I don't think we do. So above a thousand feet, so it's that's for that route. If we're going this route above, yeah, don't turn below 600 basically. So we're going to do an immediate climb then straight out to our cruise altitude, which will be, and I've not actually looked at the flight plan. Um, where are we? Initial altitude, 20,000 feet we're going up to. Let's get that programmed in. Okay, we can arm that immediately, or we should be able to. That's interesting. Why can't we arm that? Hmm. Oh, flight directors. Being ridiculous. Oh, have I missed them off my list? There we go. I've got something slightly out of order now on my list, though. That's good to know about. I need to, I need to change that then. Um, so MCP. So then, once we've got the data configured, we can click the flip chart, and you'll see the markers move. So the yellow one becomes the VT ro rotate marker, which is good. Um, what else? Click the flip chart. We've done the flight directors. Nav one. We've done. Okay, so overhead we can go and put the seatbelt sign on, which is somewhere around here. Fasten belts. There it is. Tell everybody to sit down. <laughs> and we can organise the pushback. So it's in the aircraft tab, and you click the three arrows, and then we can say connect. Oh, this, this happened instantly. That's rather interesting. So, come off the parking brake. Oh, the chocks haven't removed. That's interesting. That was different to earlier today. They weren't they weren't in place the other bit, the other day when I did this. So, let's have a quick look at the runway layout. We're going to be taking off runway one four. So we're going that way. So we're going to need to double back on ourselves, essentially. Oops. Oh, I hate it when FlightSim does that. So we're going to be doubling back around there. So we're just trying to get away from the stand, really. We'll get away from the road as well and park ourselves here while we do engine start. Okay, so we'll stop the pushback. I think we have to do it in here, don't we? Oh no, it's already done it. That's good. Okay, so control eight, go overhead, put the beacon light on, and then control seven, go and turn all the pumps on, and then put the start master to on, 
switch to the engine we want to start. And start the engine. So you can see power's coming up. So if we scoot across here a little bit. So the lights will go out on the ignition system once engine number four is up and running. And engine number three. Uh, start. Helps if you start it. There we go. Numbers are coming up. So when this comes past 10% on N2, I believe we should be able to advance this anyway. I need to double check that in the documentation. I think it's 10% on N2. Oh, it's really stuttering badly, isn't it? To the point it's making the view changing difficult. It's because of all this detail. This is an enormously detailed airport. Just waiting for these lights to go out. There we go. Start engine number two. Wait for the numbers. Yeah, so Skypilot is saying in the live stream comments he's been doing the um, the virtual flight online group flight. I just didn't have time to make it to it tonight, so I've come in here late to do a flight that will be mostly on autopilot, but it should be quite relaxed. Um, I'm not really watching what I'm doing now, am I? Wait for number two to come up. And number Okay, so that should go out any moment soon. There it goes. I'm just looking at my checklist. So generators one and four go to on. The ignition system can go to off. The start master can go to off now. So overhead control 7, we'll use the keys to do this to make it easier. Packs 1 and 2 can go to on there. Engine air, all of them can go to on. Brake fans can go to auto, that's further overhead isn't it? Uh, here it is. Hydraulics, engine 2 and engine 3 pumps can go to on. It looks good. And then control 7, ice protection, all the heaters to on. So screen heating, the vane heating. It's all looking good. And essentially we are ready to taxi. So before we taxi then. Ooh, that was an interesting view transition it just did then unexpectedly so we put the taxi lights to on and let's just double check 
the layout of the runway. We can do this in Navigraph, can't we? So we want runway 14, so we're going to turn right and then right again and follow Charlie Taxiway out to 14. So off the parking brake. Oh, what we need to do, um, oh, actually no, we can do this during the taxi, that's fine. Panicking over nothing here. This is the first time I've followed this particular checklist, so while we're going out we can say... Cabin crew, please take your seats for takeoff. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, but it's good fun. So we go... I just selected 18 degrees on the flaps. Is the flap lever working? It is now. So let's have a look at this layout diagram. Okay, we've got quite some way to go to Charlie. So let's go and follow this line over here. So while we are taxiing, we can also go and turn on the thrust modulation system. And we want to put it into takeoff mode. We're just going to taxi down to 1-4. Interesting that says 17, but it's marked as 14. Anyway, let's have a look from outside. Ground brake fans select on. That's the um, autopilot modes. We ought to steer already and look where we're going. <laughs> Let's put L nav on and we'll manage altitude modes once we get up and running. So we're just double checking. This is in R nav, which means it will follow the GPS. We've set the target altitude and armed it. We've set the barometric pressures. We're looking pretty good. So F1C Crazy says, Hi John. Hi. <laughs> so should we put the head tracking on as well while we're at this. Have a look around at some of the scenery. This is the, I think I've got it small backs, it's the Gold Coast airfield. It's enormously detailed. Should we get the tablet out of the way now? Actually it might come in useful later in the flight, we'll leave it there for the moment. Maybe we'll put it back on the OFP page. Okay, let's just slow ourselves right down. So we're going to flick these switches over to take off now. We're also going to go overhead and go and put the logo light on and we'll put the strobes on come back down and hopefully get onto the runway without swerving viciously across the airfield. OK, 
Okay, I think everything is in order. So, it's time GMS to go. Set to take off. Power set, flex achieved. Speed alive, both sides. 80 knots, cross checked. Gear is up. So we're going to hold 200 knots. L nav is on. Let's have a look at where we are on the flat land. So we should be turning right anytime soon. So should we go outside to see this happen? Coming up to three and a half thousand feet, so we've got some time. That's the wrong way behind us. Okay, what happened to the right turn then? Let's just see if it's drawn on correctly. No, it isn't. Okay, let's take over. Time to actually do some flying. So we're going to go heading mode for the moment. We're going to spin the heading. What's gone wrong with that then? Oh, of course we're in vectors, we want to go straight to Idna. So the easiest way to make that happen is going to be direct to Idna, number 5. And press enter. And then go for Elnav again. So what essentially happened there, I completely missed that there were vectors there, which means its own navigation essentially. So we just missed the turn by a couple of miles and we're now straight lining it. So if we put a, um, a custom waypoint in, we're essentially doing that now. Okay. And we're holding 200 knots. Should we go back to vertical speed mode and get some speed up? I'm just going to dip the nose slightly. So we're just going to come off the climb rate a little bit. So if I go vertical speed, off, trim the nose down. There we go. Okay, so we also need to go and turn the landing lights off now. So they can go off. And also, what was the transition altitude here? Well, we were busy dealing with that. Um, 
We need to go and find that out quickly. I should have found it out before we started. 10,000, yeah, so we've just come through the transition altitude. So we go to standard barometric pressure now, 2992. I think it's synchronised in this aircraft here. Yeah, it There's no standby. Oh, that's synchronised as well, yeah. Okay, good. So we're coming up through 250 knots now. We can obviously go faster than that because we are above 10,000 feet now. So we'll let the aircraft keep going. Now we're out of the immediate climb, we can go to max continuous thrust. Okay, so while we're in the longer climb, we can go overhead and we can turn the APU out off. So there's several parts to this. You've got the APU air, which we weren't using anyway. Um, we can so stop the APU and stop the APU generator. Um, so okay, I'm just trying to catch up. Well, we've got uh, um, what was the warning for? Got any messages? Nothing. Why did we have a warning? Everything looks fine. Temperatures are all good. Looks good. Interesting. Sorry, right. Have a look at the live stream comments. Uh, do I ever play on VATSIM? Quite rarely. Uh, Nostalgic Simmer says, Well, uh, wonderful to see you coming to my hometown of Canberra. It will be there fairly soon. It's not going to take too long to fly down. So if we can have a look. On our way to Idna, and then we're going to fly basically following some of the airways along the way and then come into Canberra on the ILS. This should be a fairly relaxed flight. I should go put the weather radar on, there's no weather to see, but interesting. Why is that not coming on? Does it require the APU? Surely not. The bus tyre is on auto, so the power should have switched over. But why? I mean, we can check things, we can check the power here. Why would the APU not be working? So, AP, engine 1 generator is working. APU obviously is not. Engine 4 generator is working. Yeah, the standby ones we're not using. So, batteries. Interesting. I thought the weather radar should have switched on. Ah, oh, I'm in an, I'm in the 200 variant, I think. I wonder if it just doesn't work in this variant.
interesting. Anyway, I'm not going to worry too much. Did I just see a terrain bug? Oh my word. And it looks clickable. So if this was working... I wonder if I just... I wonder if it's broke. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. We can turn the lights off now, by the way. In the cockpit. Don't need them on. Sun's up now. Should we have a look at some of the other bits and pieces in the tablet while we're on route? So, can I get this to you? I'll use my phone to do it. Bear with me while I log into my phone. Go to the camera. Log into Navigraph. Sign in. Approve. Allow. And we have charts. Hurrah! So we should be able to go to our arrival airport and look at the star we're doing. It's the Avbeg one, isn't it? That was the DME approach, though. We want... Yeah, this one. So when we get to Avbeg, we have to be above 9,000 feet at Avbeg. And then above 10,000 at Lanyo, so we'll stay above 10,000 on the way in. And then above 7, above 5,400, and then in for the approach. Very cool. Should we have a look at the maps? Oh, it's quite slow, isn't it? But that's the fault of um, this topo maps, isn't it? the open source ones, and they are famously slow. Uh, I'll just leave on the RFP. What does it do for the Meta then? Just gives you the okay, yeah, gives you the NOAA data basically. So just coming up to cruise altitude, we need to be careful of speed. So we've gone to altitude hold. So let's come off the speed now. We can go to sync mode. Now we've stopped climbing. So we probably want about 84%, something like that. So let's go for 84 and see what happens to this needle. See if it starts going backwards or not. I think it might be losing a tiny amount, but not much. It's hardly moving. Just make sure everything's in the right place. Okay, so what we could do while we're on route, I guess. Is there any radio beacons we could play with on the way? There's one down here, Coffs Harbour. One one seven. So if we go just for a bit of fun and tune in um, on the other side of the cockpit, because the other side of the cockpit isn't using our nav, it's on nav. So we should be able to put in 117 and see it light up on the... There it goes. Very cool. So then we can play games with... I only realised you could do this recently. If we spin it round. It's... That's the bearing off of our nose towards it and the distance. So you can both do GPS on one side and radio nav on the other. <coughs> so you can you can double it up. And I didn't realise you could do that until very recently. Should go and have a look outside.
Um, I don't think this GPS, the UNS-1, really gives us much about... It doesn't give, really give you a rundown. It tells you how far it is until the next waypoint. If you go to the nav page... Yeah, it doesn't really count it down. It gives you a live wet weather. It just tells you bearing and distance between the waypoints. It's obvious, you know, over time, a lot of that information has improved. Obviously, we can cheat and go and look on a GPS map. Flying it towards Aldar, which should agree with this. There we go, look. bit of a headwind at the moment. Let's have a look at the indicated airspeed. So it's not climbing. We have to be aware though that if the wind changes that could change. Yeah so I thought I had that a little bit lower than that so I'm going to keep an eye on that. That needle has just crept higher than the bottom of the three. So I'm going to pull the throttles back a tiny bit. That's a bit too much. Okay. We're looking okay anyway. I've got to say hello to the um, co pilot. <laughs> right, while we are busy flying along, I'm going to leave it on the outside view for a bit. I'm going to go and make a coffee. I'll be back in a few minutes. Just for your interest while I do that, I'll go and open... Uh, oh, have I lost the little nav map files? Minimal, there we go. So if I put that over to one side... And hide the taskbar... There we go. Right, I'll be back in a few minutes.
Okay, I'm back. I have coffee. The magical wonder stuff that keeps me awake. <laughs> Should we just go and switch off the tooltips? I didn't realise I'd even switch them on. Don't remember doing that. I must have hit a keyboard key that does it. Oh hello, is it playing the nodding donkey game again with the trim? It's not too bad. Would this be called an internal flight? Yes, it would. So, where are we on the map? Let's go and turn the airways off so we can actually see the map. Um, okay, oh, of course I went and turned off all the toolbars, didn't I? <laughs> Open window layout, defaults, there we go. So, turn off the... Just past Alva, we're heading towards uh, Ganada, is that? And then uh, Dubbo, and then down to Parks. I guess if we look down closely enough, we'll see the radio antenna. I'm not going to be there for a while. Yeah, I'm just reading the live stream comments about this virtual meet and greet. Um, measure distance. I'm a good 300, 400 probably when you figure it all in 400 miles away. Yeah. It's going to be. What speed are we doing? We're doing about 270 knots. 275, that's indicated though, and we're at 20,000 feet, so... Should we climb to a higher altitude? We'll go faster, won't we? Um, let's go then, put this back into climb mode. Oh, sorry, max continuous thrust, I should say. Let's go and take this up to 28,000 feet. And we'll go for indicated airspeed mode and we'll open the throttles up. Whoa, look at that. Why is the... Oh, I'm, I'm pushing too far on the throttles. There we go. So the arrows came up on the TMS, meaning it couldn't adjust it back far enough to put it onto max continuous thrust. So we're basically, by using indicated airspeed mode, at the point we switch it on, it takes the reading. So it's holding the same speed we were doing, but using the excess thrust to turn into climb right, so we're coming up at about 1,100 feet a minute, up to 28,000. Obviously in the thinner air, we can go faster. So Steve says, uh, thank you for the new look and immersion aspects of Virtual Flight Online. Well, it's really, I'm leaning, I'm standing on the shoulders of others. I took the PHP VMS um, airline solution and installed it on some web space. 
and then I went and bought a load of add-ons for it, developed by a fantastic developer called Dispose. He, he goes by the name Disposable. Um, I think he's been one of the PH, or unofficially one of the PHP VMS team for a very long time. But he makes a a number of add-ons. I think he's uh, something to do with Turkish airline in the real world, in the real world, or he used to be. But um, yeah, he's worked for many years now on these add-ons for PHP VMS to make it into a more um, involving system. So Artix is saying it's always difficult for me to lend this thing. Um, I actually find it quite easy to lend. <laughs> but then I'm used to flying everything by hand. So. I mean, it does have, um, it's got glide slope lock, it's got um, VOR lock, so you can get it to automate to, a, to an extent your landing. But I, as soon as I'm within, you know, as soon as I'm stabilised, I usually turn everything off and just fly it in. It does require a little bit of dancing around to get the speed stable and to get obviously flaps configured. There's some nice stuff now in the clipboard about phases of flight and things to do along the way. So if you go next, or if we rotate this round, uh, down here. So that's about the thrust settings. Oh, wrong button. I will learn this eventually. So let's go, let's go closer to this so we can actually read it. So it's got yeah normal takeoff without noise abatement, so it's your steps to follow, so it's something to study I guess. And then it's got a noise abatement takeoff. And climb profiles. So you know basic checks to do at the various phases through the flight and some really nice lookups um, tables here. Cruise summary checks to do. There's an awful lot of information to take on board isn't there? Descent summary. Approach speeds. And you can put your own pictures in there. So if you put your own pictures in a given folder in the file system, and it's all documented, you can um, have your own pictures appearing in the clipboard, which I think is quite a cool idea. Anyway, if you click back up there again, the clipboard will magically put itself back away. I think one of the things that helped me learn to fly and land the um, the BAE 146, I think I spent a whole evening just when I first had it at uh, London City, because famously the BAE 146s were based out of London City for a long time. And I did touch and goes there for a couple of hours and just flew round and round and round. I think I may have even live streamed it. And I did it fully manually, so you know, no autopilot, nothing, I just flew it. And kept going back in and getting on the ILS and bringing it in by hand over and over again, just to get the hang of it, of how it behaves.
Um, just reading the comment there about the DC Designs Concord, I wouldn't pay too much attention to that one because DC Designs don't try to make the most realistic airplanes, although saying that Concord is one of the better ones they've made. I've had a go with it on someone else's computer. I've never actually bought it myself though. Um, so full disclosure, I had a bit of a run-in with them many, or a couple of years ago now, when they bought a Tomcat out. And I compared it against the DC, sorry, the DCS Tomcat, and the developer went absolutely mad and ended up slandering me on the flight sim forums and all sorts of things. And then I discovered, just quietly reading the forums, that he'd done it to numerous other people. He's not the, um, not the easiest person to get on with. Okay, so we're approaching 28,000 feet. So we need to go and put the engines back into sync mode and pull them back to about 85%. Easing the throttles back very gently. We'll leave an 86 and see what happens. I guess 87. Mm, that's a bit too high. There we go, 84. So that's what I was trying to get to earlier. It's very fiddly to get the correct speeds, but we'll see. We'll see if it gains speed or not. So we can look at ground speed. Does this give us ground speed, by the way, on the GPS? Or is it literally just for guidance? Uh, ground speed, 387, yes. So we're doing nearly 400 knots over the ground. There any other VORs we can use on route? There's some Yeah, there's only non-directional beacons by the look of it. But there's the parks of VOR 112. So if we go and switch that on. Can we pick it up yet? What direction would we expect to see it? So if we go measure distance, it's it's 200 miles away yet. Yeah? And what is the range on it? Uh, that's the wrong way I've picked up there. Show information for the parks VOR. You know, 180 miles range. So we'll pick it up soon. So off of our nose, Parks VOR is about 210 degrees. So if we spin the course round to 210, that should be pointing more or less straight at it. Yeah, relative to us. Should we tune um, Nav 1 as well? Although this is using the GPS to do this, isn't it? That's the next waypoint. That's interesting, isn't it? So that doesn't appear on here, but it does appear here. So this will come to life, though, if we go and tune in the nav radio. So if we go for the same frequency, 11200, so we're tuning active directly. Hasn't come up just yet. We'll spin the course round, just as we have with this one, to 210. Again, this won't affect guidance because we're in RNAV mode, so we're using GPS. So 
So Scott says, I was watching a person online who is a captain in real life and she was adding those lines to beacons. Why do you do that? If anyone doesn't mind. Um, was she using a 737 by any chance? One, one of the features of the Boeing FMC is on the navigation display you can draw vector lines. So you can, based on a line through a waypoint, and a bearing, you can draw a, a, a reference line on the chart or on the navigation display. So if that helps you, Scott, it's just for orientation purposes. They might put um, either radiuses or circles, dotted circles or straight lines on the chart to help just with orientation. So the, the Boeing FMC is very good for that kind of thing. I don't think you can do it with the Airbus FMC. Okay, we're heading in towards Park slowly. We should be picking up the VOR radio sometime soon. We can actually figure it out. So if we go and right click on parks on here and add a range ring, we can put one in at 180 miles. Okay, so yeah, we're just outside of that 180 mile range. Waypoint rings the bell. She had a couple of straight lines. I don't remember the plane, a big one. <laughs> yeah, so the reason you might do it it's just for visual reference purposes. So say you have um, a waypoint down here and you want it to be coming away from it. Given, if you imagine doing this in the aeroplane, you might extend a vector through it towards the runway. So then that would appear on your navigation display. But yeah, there's all sorts of reasons, just, you know, just for orientation purposes. So we should pick up the VOR. You'll see the DME kick in when it picks it up and you'll see the needles spin around. Both needles will spin around because we've tuned both radios in to 11200, which should be the Parks VOR station. We'll see how quickly we pick it up. Depending on the weather, you might not pick it up as quickly as you think. giving us a ground speed, but that's probably coming from the, yeah, that's coming from the GPS. The nav radio hasn't picked anything up yet. Oh, here it goes. It's just coming, look, 179 miles. And it's coming over here as well. Excellent. It's working. It's interesting the two nav radios are slightly different than each other in their reading. Fills you full of confidence, doesn't it? Fuel. 
So if you look at this, if we can get close enough to it, So it's times a hundred, so five hundred per hour. So two thousand an hour across all four engines. And we've got two and a half thousand on each side. So we've got enough to fly there and back again basically. It's interesting because I just went with the fuel that Simbrief told me to pack the plane with. Obviously it put a lot of excess in there for whatever reason. I mean, looking at the original plan, it does have, if we couldn't land at uh, Canberra, we've got enough fuel to fly all the way over to Sydney, which is over 100 miles away. Should get rid of those range rings now. How does Navigraph show this? Should we leave the um, approach chart in place? It was the same one we saw in the aeroplane, if you remember, going from Alfbeg and then following in for the ILS into um, Canberra. So let's just double check. Uh, let's have a look at the approach chart. Uh, transition altitude 10,000 feet. There's the ILS for later, 109.5, 348 degrees. So we come in at 5,400 feet into the feathers. Okay, that's all fine then. So looking at it from the wider perspective, we had 7,000 then 5400 okay and obviously it's above 7000 above 10 above 9 but yeah 10 is above 9 so we'll come in we'll be descending the, the real I guess the real marker to aim for is 10 at Lanyo and then you can just manage it gently down See if there's any weather around in the way. Uh, some bits of cloud on the radar out over the, um, the coast, but there's not too much. There's a little bit on our approach, otherwise we're fairly clear. Just here, look, there's parks. So it's just going to be a bit cloudy, I think. Let's have a look at the um, cloud cover. Of course, this is rated on altitude. So if we go to, say, 10,000 feet as we're coming in... No, nothing. There's some low-level cloud at sort of 6,000 feet, but not much. OK. What about wind? Is there much wind around? Not really. The barbs are not very strong at all. Okay. The other thing we can do, which I always forget we can do, is openwindy.com. That's the wrong address. There we go. And if we were to go and find Australia and find the part of the world we're flying, yeah, you can see, look. So there's parks, so there's hardly any wind around this area at the moment. why we can't see any on the map.
does the game allow you to do a fuel dump? Um, if the aeroplane has the functionality, then yes, of course, the aeroplane will let you do a fuel dump if it's implemented. Otherwise, as someone's already said, you can just go up here and change the weight and balance, but not on the realistic aeroplanes, they tend to ignore that. So in the realistic aeroplanes, you have to do your loading of fuel on the ground through the tablet. So in here, for example, you saw, if you were watching earlier, I had to go and do the payload when we were on the ground. And that loaded the fuel. So you can see this is greyed out. Look, I can't change it while we're in flight. The cargo, for example. Also, if you go and look in the OFP, that will have the original fuel planning load sheet. Should we go see if we can make the um, coffee pot work? No, where's... I, I did find this the other day. Where's the... the galley power? There it is. Oh dear, I appear to have left all the passengers. <laughs> it would be good, wouldn't it, if more companies put passengers into the um, cabin. I mean, I know it's great that there is a cabin at all. I haven't turned off the passenger seating sign, have I? Whoops. So busy talking, you see. Let's go and do that. Yeah, a rampage now as everybody runs to the toilet. How do I walk like that? <laughs> oh, so many jokes could write themselves with me. Um, using the curse keys. So I can use. You can move, you can, you can map keys to move yourself up and down and around and walk around and then obviously I can hold the right mouse button down to aim myself as well. Let's return the coffee pot back off. There's a big light switch up here as well, which turns on that lamp. It's a bit random, but they've implemented it, so why not? The other thing is the cabin radio, if you've not seen it, it works. So you saw it when we were loading passengers earlier and they were playing the incidental music. But you can play it while you're in flight if you really want to and mess around with it. You can put your own MP3s in it apparently. You just have to put them in the right folder. Of course, because you can have your own MP3s, you could have clips of famous speeches from movies and they to either terrify or amuse your passengers appropriately. <laughs> Just reading the live stream comments. You have a tap beneath your monitor. Do I? There is a skateboard on rails in the aisle. Is there? Oh yes, that's how I'm rolling along here. I see, sorry, I'm a bit slow on the update today. <laughs> so how much obsessiveness have they gone to with this? Can we turn the lights on? No, we can't. Oh, that's a shame, isn't it? What about flipping the boards down now? There's no, like, um, safety cards you can pull out and read. I 
I'm not looking for Easter eggs, honest. Anyway. <laughs> Just reading the comment about I'd be worried if the captain really was walking around looking for safety cards or it. <laughs> I re remember, oh, mostly 25 years ago now, I was flying over to the US to visit my cousin. And this was back in when the entertainment systems on aeroplanes were kind of in their infancy. And they did have a, a movie system that could play on the back of the seats. So they had like r rudimentary rubbishy flat screens to be honest. But um, the, the movies wouldn't play. And the, the flight crew looked into it and restarted the system twice in a row. And it didn't work. And in the end the captain came over the PA system and just said, um, I'm sure you'd all agree, it's far more important that I fly the aeroplane than try to diagnose what's wrong with the entertainment system. So I'm afraid, that, ladies and gentlemen, I will be flying the aeroplane for the rest of the flight and not fiddling with the entertainment system. <laughs> oh dear. It's always amused me. I did wonder how many people were absolutely furious that he hadn't spent his time fixing the, the entertainment system. Now look at the speed coming off, what's happened. The throttles have moved. Now it's probably a USB glitch that's caused that. Interesting. Or has it just the wind has changed? Have we got a tailwind by any chance? So how can we tell easily? Let's have a look at little that one. No, we got a crosswind, 30 knots. I was say, it wouldn't be out of the realms of possibility if you suddenly got a massive tailwind that that would indicate it's the same kind of thing. But, and, well, actually, no, it wouldn't, because you're moving with the mass of air. So it wouldn't change that markedly. Really. I think I was just a USB glitch again. I've had them a few times recently. I'm hammering the engines, so I'm going to keep an eye on the needles here. We're kind of outside of normal parameters. But we are accelerating. <laughs> so where are we on the route? How long until we start descending? So if you remember looking at the Navigraph, come and look here. So we need to be 10,000 feet at Alpmeg, or thereabouts. Although we did say, didn't we, 10,000, yeah, at Lanyo. So, and that distance there is, is that 41 miles? Is this a scale on it? You can see it on the little map, actually, can't we? We can cheat. Uh, 41 miles here. So... About 15,000 feet you could lose in 40 miles. So 
so we don't need to descend until we get to just before Alphabet really. doing a mental arithmetic in my head for that. On the three to one basis of three miles along is 1,000 feet. Most of the big jets you work to that three to one ratio. Three miles per thousand feet. So Scott Freckle is saying, so the maps are marked with height recommendations you should be at certain distances. Do you mean on the flight plan or just across the map? I can show you what I'm talking about on Little Nav Map. Oops. Um, so if we pull up the numbers, now where are they? I used to know where all of this was and I've forgotten slowly over time. They removed it from the little lab map. It used to have the minimum safe altitudes. Maybe it just hasn't got a button on the toolbar anymore. There it is. So do you mean these numbers? If you mean these numbers, these, yeah, this is minimum safe altitudes. Oh, there it is. That was the button I was looking for. So, little nav map gives you various maps you can look at. Um, an actual real flight chart looks like the ones in Navigraph. Whoa, I'm overspeeding there. The overspeed is sending Morse code. <laughs> there we go, finally. Um, sorry, so if I just have a look on here. So the numbers and distances you're seeing on this chart, this line is called a standard terminal arrival route. And it's a predetermined route that's agreed and filed in a database that's commercially available that um, the controllers know about. So if they give an aircraft this route, the aircraft, or, or the aircraft also has it, and they can fly that route. And it's an, obviously it doesn't make much difference with an airport that's not near any other airports. But um, say you've got several big city airports near each other. You imagine these are corridors through the sky and they're all avoiding each other. So they're trusting that you will follow the instruction and that kind of slot through the sky avoids other routes at the altitudes it determines. So in other words, on this one, like above 9,000, you probably find there's some hills there. So if we say um, here, yeah, so we can cheat in little nav map and show the profile. Yeah, look, there's hills. So it's actually avoiding these peaks on the way in. But it may be that there are other routes that cross through that we're not seeing, obviously, that go underneath them. Or there could be sectors. If we turn the sectors on on the map, you get air traffic control sectors. Um, if we put all of them on, it'll make a real mess of the map, but you'll see what I'm talking about. So if you imagine, we can't turn this into 3D, but if we could, you'll get different areas at different heights that you're allowed, to, or that you're not allowed to fly into, unless you're controlled and cleared into those areas. 
Yeah, so around here, for example, you would be controlled in, and uh, I think this is the Class D area around the airport here. So if you hover over it, it tells you in a little nav map look the altitude limits of each sector. So there's actually a number of sectors on top of each other there, look. So if you imagine a three-dimensional cake <laughs> in terms of the, all the sectors, then you'll only be cleared on the... your flight plan will be within particular um, sectors. So it might only be within a certain height range. Yeah, so you can make this look a real mess really quickly. I'm going to turn that back off anyway. But that's where flying with some with you know with air traffic controllers comes in because as you go into a sector you are cleared into the sector and then you are you know you communicate with ATC and they track you throughout that sector. But most people who fly on flight sim just messing around have no idea that that's what's really going on. If you imagine tilting this through three dimensions there's all of these three-dimensional blocks in the sky that are controlled. So at given altitudes, uh, a good one is like around London. Um, you're not allowed anywhere near any of the airports below 2,500 feet. And you can see the sectors really clearly around them in London. Once you're above that, you can fly over the airports. But it's a different sector above them, if that makes sense. So a different controller. Just get a ding dong on the cabin. Oh, it's probably a, one of those automated things where I'm supposed to tell the um, passengers and come out with a spiel about, you know, we're, we're arranging to descend soon. If you need to go to the toilet, please do so. <laughs> tell them about the, um, the weather at the destination. It is funny though, the longer you spend, I'm just reading the comment there in the live stream about this being daunting, the longer you spend messing around with flight simulators, when you do get on the real plane it gives you much more appreciation of what the crew are doing. Especially when you start learning about the communication procedures, um, you know, the operating the aeroplane, and it's, it's fascinating. The only reason they climb to altitude, by the way, is for um, saving money. Air jet engines run more efficiently at altitude, so you can go faster and use less fuel the higher you go. So just reading the conversation there about approaches, I just picked this one because it was nice and easy and straightforward. We can superimpose that Razi one on just the chart just to show people it if you want. So at the moment, I think is Razi the one that does the maintaining a an arc, a DME arc. Um, if we go right click on the airport and show the arrival procedures. And we've got Razi, that's that one. Maybe these ones were in it. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of the approach then, or not the star. Yeah, there we go, look. The alternative approach would have been to fly a DME arc around the airfield and then come in. But I went for the more straightforward one. I, I nearly went for it just because it was, you know, it was interesting. Do I have a favourite difficult approach? Oh yes, I do. 
<laughs> and I've recorded videos with it. Uh, La Guardia in New York is the expressway visual into Runway 31. It's brilliant. So I can pull it up on the map actually. We've got a little while yet. I'll just go and check where we are before I go and wander off doing something else. Okay, yeah, so we're just coming in here. So let's go and find New York for you. So here's LaGuardia. The expressway visual, you fly in over the bay. Let's turn all of the stuff off on the map so we can actually see what we're doing. So I'm just going to get our bearings. This is the expressway. Yeah. So you fly in from the bay as if you're going into runway 04. Notice there's only a 7,000 foot runway as well. You fly in and then you get level with there's some water towers just here. Um, so you're flying as if you're going towards runway 04 at 2500 feet and you turn right and you fly along the top of the expressway, over the expressway. As you come along here you descend to a thousand feet. You fly around the back of this water fountain and around the back of City Field Stadium, descending as you go, getting to about 300 feet by the time you're here, and go whizzing over the roof of Home Depot and land on runway 31. You don't see the runway really until you're already turning and you're looking left out of the cockpit and seeing it r literally directly to your left and you're turning the whole way round. With no re you don't have a stabilised approach. You come straight in and the moment you stop turning, you're on finals. But it's great fun. And there's lots of videos of real crews doing it on the internet. Anyway, let's go and put this stuff back on. And go and find our aeroplane. There we are. So we're about to fly over the top of Parks. Can we see the radio telescope? I'm not sure where it is in relation to the airport. I'm amazed it's not marked on the map. Unless I'm just being completely blind. Ah, uh, we haven't put this on the right altitude, have we? Yeah, so this is showing us, look, just before Avbeck to begin the descent, which is what we'd said.
can I hear the VOR sound? Uh, where's the panel in this aeroplane to do that? Um, not all of the aeroplanes. Oh, we didn't put. Oh, look, this has some um, TCAS. I didn't realise. Interesting. Um, it's over here, isn't it? The volumes. Maybe it doesn't do it. Because you'd have thought this would have been doing it by now. Unless there's a button, there's a button maybe I'm not clicking somewhere that will make it start making noise. Yeah, I thought that would have done it. Can we just test those? If we just go over here... Yeah, I don't know to what extent any of this is actually simulated. CWR, top of descent is a little bit before Avbeg. So we've got about 70 miles to go until we start descending. We have to start getting a little bit busier than we have been and actually concentrate. <laughs> start doing things properly. Where did all this clap come from? It's not on, is it? Because we don't get to enjoy the scenery on the way down. Should we bring it down to 20,000 feet? Because we did extend up, didn't we? So let's come down to 20,000. Arm it. We'll go for indicated airspeed mode. What should we? This has done it again, look. It's dropped the throttles right back to 80%. So let's just speed this back up a bit first before we descend. Pass up an altitude hold for the moment. Let the aeroplane speed itself back up. Although saying that, if we just start descending on vertical speed mode. That will work, won't it? That will speed us back up. So, nose down, just watch the vertical speed here. Should go a thousand feet a minute. So you can see the 
indicate their speed is increasing there without thrashing the engines. I've never really played with a stopwatch in this. We get it to about 250 knots and then we'll go to indicate their speed mode and that'll be good to all the way down to 10,000 to be honest. Okay, let's switch over then to indicated mode. So 250 is what it will maintain there for us. So if we come off the throttle, it will turn our lack of thrust into descent rate. In order to maintain 250 knots. And we can cheat a little bit and look in the little nav map and you can see like a vector. Remember we're only coming down to 20,000 at the moment so if we put this on here we're aiming to come down to that which is where we should have been and then we'll be able to descend on the plan. reading the live stream comment about the pilot and co-pilot having running races down the cabin. <laughs> Very good. It's very quiet, isn't it? So yeah, just reading Dave Bass's comment about um, Canberra being between Sydney and Melbourne. I watched a fascinating documentary about yeah, Melbourne wanted to be the the capital, didn't it? And so did Sydney, and they couldn't decide, <laughs> so they built it in between on purpose. <laughs> Oh dear, you couldn't make it up. It's a great story though. Ding dong! So I guess I need to tell the passengers now to go and put their seatbelts on. And there's another sound clip we can use, isn't there, in the aeroplane section? So we can do seats for landing, but we won't do that until we begin our final descent. Right. 
So the next waypoint on the UNS-1 is Afbeg, and it is 40 miles away. We're obviously counting away from parks now. So are there any radio beacons down here? Yeah, there's the one at the destination, like 11670, we may as well. Although we probably need to have the INS tuned in then, to be honest. Let's go and do that way ahead of time. 109.5 and 348 degrees. So, uh, 109.5. And switch. And 109.5. Actually, rather than doing both, um, let's go and tune this one to Canberra, 116.7. Um, we've picked up Canberra already. Um, there's not much point doing the course, but we can obviously read what direction Can Canberra is from us, directly in front of us, basically. there. So VOR1 is reading nothing and VOR2 is reading Canberra 58 miles out. But obviously we're going to be going around Canberra. So we're going to be going following this racetrack route to get onto the ILS. It's Waypoint Scott W A Y. So is a waypoint different to a vector point? All a waypoint is, is a point in space that is agreed that's in a database that everybody has. Um, so a vector is a line between two points or through two points, technically. So, w w one of these airways, that is a vector, it's a line between two points in space. But a waypoint is just one of these triangular points that's on the map. They're sometimes called fixes as well. You get various types of beacon, it's easier to see in little nav maps. So a square with a um, hexagon inside it is a VOR, which is a radio beacon that can tell you distance and um, direction. So it can tell you that you know the direction you are in relation to it. There are various other types of radio beacon as well. Um, military have ones called Vortec, which is a combination of VOR and TACAN. Then you get pure TACAN radio beacons, which don't work with all radio sets. It depends what kit you've got, what, you've compa what you're compatible with. There's another one over here, look. That's a non-directional beacon. So that's what you'd use with ADF, an automatic direction finder. What it means by non-directional is um, it can't tell what radial you are on, but you can tell what direction it is from you, if that makes sense. Um, you have to understand VORs, really, to understand the difference between those two. But uh, NDBs predate VORs. VORs are being made obsolete very quickly, obviously, because GPS. You know exactly where you are at all times with GPS. Don't have to tune into anything. Um, obviously, ILS still uses a radio beacon. So projected out from the runway in this narrow corridor is a very accurate radio signal that the aeroplane can tune into. So within that funnel, 
you can figure out exactly where you are. How are we doing in terms of descent? We didn't target, oh, actually we didn't arm 20,000, did we? So we carried on down anyway. Which is fine. If we carry on at the same rate, down to 10,000 feet, And we'll arm that one, and we'll also go and do the, um... Well, that was impressive, wasn't it? I was, going to get, I was getting quite excited about pressing that. <laughs> it wasn't really worth doing. Isn't there an actual button setting that says VOR, etc., to set that type of vector? No. Um, if you're wanting to program it into a flight plan, this, this flight computer is not the one to learn with, because it's very 1980s. It's like programming a, a video cassette recorder in 1983. <laughs> um, VOR radios, you tune in the nav radio to a VOR station and then the instruments in the cockpit will reflect what you have done. So th at, at the moment this is operating, these operate, this is called an HSI, Horizontal Situation Indicator, um, and it can operate in two modes. You can either use the nav radios, which I'm not doing, or you can use GPS, which I am doing. So at the moment, it's just showing me the direction to the next waypoint. If we were in nav radio mode, I could actually spin the course round, and the middle of this is called a course deviation indicator, and it will sway to one side or the other. You, it works on ILS, you'll see it happen on ILS. It sways to one side or the other, telling you if you are to the left or the right of the line that you wanted to be on, and you set the line you want to be on, by setting the course, which rotates this needle. But when you're in GPS mode or RNAV mode, it doesn't do that, it just points at the next waypoint all the time. So course doesn't influence it. Yeah, so I can, I can move the course, look, and nothing happens. But having said that, we haven't gone and set the, um, the ILS, have we? So let's go and have a look. 109.5, we did that, we didn't do the course. 348 degrees. So this is just preparing for that. It won't influence this because it's in GPS mode, but we're going to go and get it ready. Three, four, eight degrees. How, how far have we got on this leg until I have to change direction? OK, so we're flying down here now. We need to come down a bit more quickly, actually. Um, Yeah, all I was going to say is what we could do is put the heading bug the same direction we're going. So I'm just moving this heading bug. I'll put us in heading mode and I'll turn the navigation system over to... There you go, look. So we wanted 348 degrees, wasn't it? Uh, 348. So we spin the course round. You can see the needle moving on the HSI. So what we're actually saying there is we're, we're the little aeroplane going that way. That's the runway direction. So you think about it on here. We're flying down here. We're going to have to turn around and come in. So this will all spin around. And when we're in line with the runway, this line will float into the middle. Yeah, so at the moment it's saying we are to the left of the centre line. And look at that. We are to the left. Yeah, if you, if you think in terms of the direction we're going, the centre line, the runway's over here, it's to our left. So I'm going to put this back onto GPS for the moment. And we'll also go and, yeah, we can leave that one alone, it's all fine. I guess we could spin this back around to 348.
course I could have showed you it over there without switching this onto heading mode. So I'll put this back onto lateral navigation mode, which means it's now going to track the GPS and not the heading. We could also arrange the heading ready for landing and put it onto 348 as well. somewhere there but yeah you'll see this come alive when we're on approach and you'll see me chasing the needles so we're coming down to 13,000 feet we're looking pretty good actually so you can see there's some um, restrictions on the way in let's go and have a look again so above 10,000 feet at Lanyo above 7,000 feet at Honey and above 5,400 feet at Menzi so yes yeah, Scott just reading your comment there yes we're parallel to the runway you can see it on the map we are flying down here look if you watch this one's still working on nav mode. It's gone to from. There it goes. You see the arrow switch across, meaning we've just gone past the beacon. Yeah. So you get this little white arrow that tells you that the heading you have marked is either going from or to. At the moment we're going from. Anyway. Obviously as you turn around that arrow will flick round as well. Meaning you're going to it. Because we're in GPS mode on this one. There is no little white arrow. Hey, 11,000 feet. So just approaching 10,000 feet, the next thing we need to think about is going and setting the barometric pressure of the altimeter to the destination airport. So we're going to open the airport information for Canberra and go for the weather and it tells us it's 1013 hectopascals or 2991 inches. So we're at 10,000 feet so we'll do it now. So we want 2991. Oh, it's a tiny amount different than what we've got. Look, that's fine. So that makes the altimeter read correctly according to the ground. Also at 10,000 feet, we go and put the landing lights on. Now we have to stay at 10,000 feet or above until we get past Lanyo, and then we can carry on to Honey. If we look down here, to see look the next waypoint is Lanyo and then one after that is Honey. So at the moment we are in altitude halt mode and we can go and preset the next target altitude and we could even arm it. The aeroplane won't do anything yet because we haven't told it how to get there. Make sense? We're just chugging along towards Lanyo. But actually, we're not going to get down to 7,000 feet for Honey. We're actually wanting to get to 5,400 feet for Menzi. So let's do that. So let's just arm it and unarm it and rearm it just to make sure it's understood what we're doing. Okay. So we're going to put this into indicated airspeed mode and we're going to pull the throttle back. Now, do we have any speed restrictions? We don't. So we could go a maximum of 250 knots around this corner, but I've let some of the speed bleed off. So at the point we switched on indicated airspeed, it would have said like 220 knots and it would keep it there. So if we want to descend any faster than that, we just need to pull the throttles back more. So if I pull the throttles all the way back, 
I can actually see this on the little nav map easier. Can you see the, the red vector there? That's our descent rate. It's not bad actually, that's about right. And you can see the restrictions are marked in as well, look. The minimum altitudes. And that's to do with the minimums over the hilltops. So I'm coming around a bit too steep, but that could be to do with the roll. So we're obviously losing lift on the wings. But I can obviously open the engines up a bit more. Which will kick the nose up we're in indicated airspeed mode it's using pitch to control speed so I just provide power to control the descent rate okay turning towards daily we need to be at 210 knots at daily so what we can do is go and Go for vertical speed mode at the rate we're coming down at the moment and we can pull the throttles back a bit more and lose a bit more speed. You can see the needle is just dropping back there because we want to get to 210 knots or below 210 so we'll go for 200, 190, something nice and slow. Plane's turning in again. If we want to slow the plane down quickly, we can use spoilers. I don't think we're going to need to. That's interesting. What's it doing? Okay, I'm taking over. Not the end of the world. So we're going to go at this point straight over to ILS mode. I probably just didn't, I didn't do a gross check on the plan. Now notice, look, we've overshot the center line of the runway. Bank angle, bank angle. Yeah, don't worry about that. So all I need to do is come back across the line of the runway. We're speeding up as well, so let's put the spoilers out. Get ourselves back under two, 10 knots. Just going to get this so you can see everything. Speed checked below 205, select flaps 80. Done. So what you can see here, let me sit up so you can see over the top of the yoke. We are slightly above the glide slope at the moment. So I'm going to push the nose down. We're 11 miles out. Speed check below 205, select gear down. Gear down. So we're 11 miles out. We're slightly off to the right of the centre line. We're slightly above the glide slope. So I'm just going nose down a little bit. Let's get the, if I get rid of the yoke out of the way, I can sit back down. Okay. Doesn't the cloud always appear at the right times? Open the throttles back up to maintain speed now. trying to trim it as well as we go. We're, now we're below the glide slope. So can you see that here? The little line? So we're chasing this and that line. But keeping an eye on the attitude indicator. Ignore the flight director. It's lost its mind because there's obviously something wrong with the flight plan. Or I didn't check it properly. So this means we're slightly below, Speed so we can... Select flaps 30. Done. So we're just maintaining our descent rate. We're coming closer and closer to this. We'll turn right in a moment. 
So we keep an eye on the altitude indicator. See, we don't need to be able to see the runway at all. So we're at 3,900 feet over the ground. We're too low. Going for full flaps. So hopefully, Speed very shortly, Select yeah. flap 33. I've done that. I'm ahead of him. There we go. We can actually see ahead of us now. Look. So let's keep an eye out in front of us, and we should see the runway come out of the murk towards us. So we're just following these two needles blindly basically trimming as we go and just trying to keep the aeroplane stable no big movements going a bit fast going a bit low We're off to the left slightly. There's the wind swirling around a little bit. We're three miles out. And there's the runway just coming out of the Merc right in front of us. We're just going off to the right look, just gently bring it back. Strong crosswind, but look at it. So you can see the papi lights now alongside the runway. We want two reds and two whites. At the moment, we're too low. We've got three reds each side. When they're on the correct light slope, we've got two reds and two whites. The wind is swirling, it's moving us around. We're not too high. Fifty, forty, thirty, twenty, ten. Round idle. Okay, spoilers down. Great pressure seam. Yellow and green spoilers. 80 knots. And flaps can come up, spoilers can come off, the centre of view up, and let's put the head tracking on and we can have a nosy around at the airport. Now which side do we come off? Left side I guess. So the lights go back to taxi as we come off the runway, and the strobe lights come back off. bring it to a halt to do that. So I don't quite know what happened with the flight plan there. I'll have to go and check that. It will be something obvious. So strobes off. You may even find there was a vector in that and I just hadn't dealt with it, or even the discontinuity. I'm not sure if you get discontinuities in the BAE 146 there. So Toby Eye Tracker is, is good, there's lots of ways. If you want to have a play with head tracking, you can get a thing called Smooth Tracker on your phone, or there's another one called Beam Tracker, I think, lots of people have been talking about recently, where you can use your mobile phone camera to figure out which way your face is pointing. 
and you know, you obviously you prop your phone at the bottom of your monitor or something, and then you can hook it up with a simulator, so you can try out how head tracking works. It does work really nicely. Obviously, the custom-built things like Toby, they they work better, but they're very expensive. So if you just want to try it out, I tried out Smooth Track first. And the only reason I've got a Toby head tracker is because Toby gave me one. I don't think I would have spent the money on it personally otherwise. Okay, so I have the custom scenery for this airport from Orbex, so we should get a very, very accurate rendition of Canberra. Let's bring it into one of the terminals. Should we go straight into this one in front of us. I imagine we don't need anything for a bigger jet, do we? So if we put the parking brake on. So in the... I'm going to do this without head tracking. In the 146, on the taxi back, we could have gone and put the APU on. Uh, so we've still got the pumps on, so we can go and fire up the APU, and obviously it will do its thing. And then once the APU is up and running, we can shut the engines off without losing power to the rest of the aircraft. Um, I'm not sure what we can do in terms of... I don't think this works with jetways, does it? But we can put the chocks around the aeroplane. Just waiting for the APU to come online. It will light up saying power available. There we go, at which point we can kill the engines. Okay, we leave the left inner pump on for the APU. We can turn the main generators off, put the APU gen on, and go and start turning things off around the plane that we had switched on. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -dum. Okay, and up here that was just the oh yeah the ore dampers, the AP avionics, um, the pumps, brake fans can go to off. Trying to remember what we put on and what we didn't. <laughs> Shut off the tank transfer now. Okay, so yeah, you can just sit here all day now on the APU, really, just burning the fuel down, or you can switch over to external power if it's available. You can make it available by connecting it here. So we could go do that. We could put the passenger door open, which is nicely animated actually. If we then go and do the stairs... And I haven't turned off the um, taxi lights, have I? Oops. Turn the seatbelt sign off and let everybody scramble for the exit. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I've already turned off the avionics, so we have got no way of knowing what I did on the flight plan. I obviously did something silly. There was probably a vector in there or something. 
Actually, I bet there was. Although, mm, I don't know, because that all connected. That connected into Menzi, and it should have gone straight on. How odd. But anyway, that's why you have to keep an eye on your aeroplane, and if need be, do what I did, and just switch off the autopilot and correct the issue. Um, obviously, to switch the plane off completely now, we can just go and turn the APU to off. Turn the pumps off, turn the APU generator off, and then turn the batteries off. And plane is dead. Did I turn off the avionics? Yes, I did. Oh, I didn't turn off the lift spoilers, though. There we go. So this aeroplane does have state saving as well, which I don't know if I've got it switched on. Um... Yeah, oh no, I haven't got it switched on. So in that case, you know, if you don't dis sp switch everything back off afterwards, you'll be you'll find yourself in trouble pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, can we do disembark? Yes, we can. So we can say start deboarding. So now we're waiting for everybody to get off. So you'll see the total passenger number decrease, and you'll see the cargo drop down. It's very cool, isn't it? I think this is already open around the back for the cargo to get out. Yeah, the cargo doors are open. Look. It's not quite as clever as some of the other aeroplanes where they've got ground services that you can summon from the tablet. But it's pretty good. Obviously you could do it via the... I've, I've turned off the um, radios, but could press scroll lock to pull up the um, ATC. If you install there's an add-on for flight simulator called GSX, in which case you would see people climbing down the ladder and, you know, pe people in the cabin sitting in the seats and then you'd see them climbing down and walking out back over to the terminal with cones and staff and the whole bit. GSX is a, a bit of a monster. I've not played with it at all. I thought it looked a bit too much like a rabbit hole to me that I would never escape from. <laughs> There's also another add-on called self-loading cargo that simulates the experience of the passengers. So as well as flying the aeroplane, you have to try and keep the passengers happy. So you're kind of being the steward on the aircraft as well. So you might, you know, be giving drink to a troublesome passenger to shut them up. And, or, you know, someone's causing trouble and you have to separate them and all the rest of it. Or if you don't fly the aeroplane smoothly, then the passengers start complaining. Anyway. Yeah, it's endless, the things you can do with this simulator. Absolutely endless. Should we go and have a nose around the um, airport? Uh, bear with me a moment. I need to plug an Xbox controller in to do this. So we're at Canberra. Let's go and have a wander around the terminal. I'm just fetching an Xbox controller and plugging it in. So bear with me. And resume. Okay, so there's our aeroplane. Wonder if we can walk all the way through the um oh, it's not very well modelled, is it? guess. That's just madness, isn't it? 
So if anybody's been to Canberra Airport, they probably can tell you it looks exactly like this, and this is absolutely spooky. Oh, Mandalorian must have been the big show on the TV when they made the scenery, I guess. But yeah, you can see outside across the the airport. So if we zoom through the glass. Have a look around at some of the other assets here. It's amazing, isn't it? The attention to detail, some of this scenery. Where's the control tower? She can have a nosy at it. It's a good question, actually. Where is the tower here? Presumably that's the military side on the opposite side of the airport because there's um, a reconnaissance aircraft over there parked up on the ground. And have a nose at it while we're here. Be a shame not to, wouldn't it? Anyway. I think that's quite enough nosing around. It's impressive, isn't it? The amount of detail they've gone into was modelling the airfield and the you know the surrounding environment. It's a huge IKEA over there. <laughs> Oh, 
Ikea, as the um, Swedish call it. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there, and I'll see you all soon. So that was a flight in the BAE 146 from um, Gold Coast down to Canberra. And we still have a usable aeroplane that we can fly again, which is always a good thing. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there, so I'll see you all again soon. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Take care. Good evening.